Welcome to Caregiver Wellbeing, Your Mental Health Matters. I'm happy to be introducing Tammy Anastasia. Tammy is a dementia consultant, educator, and speaker. She's also the author of the acclaimed book, Essential Strategies for the Dementia Caregiver, Learning to Pace Yourself. Tammy holds a Master of Arts in Counseling, a Certificate in Gerontology, and a Certificate in End of Life. She's also a Certified Senior Advisor. For more than 30 years, Tammy has provided counseling services, dementia guidance, emotional support, and care strategies to family and professional dementia caregivers. She also facilitates twice monthly support groups. Please join me in welcoming Tammy. Ah, Sally, thank you for that nice introduction, and thank you everybody for attending today's webinar on Caregiver Wellbeing, Your Mental Health Matters. I'm going to begin my presentation by going over a few facts about dementia caregiving. Three out of four dementia caregivers express concern about maintaining their own health since becoming a caregiver because of the demands and the responsibilities that accumulate as you travel this journey. And the demands and the challenges, the responsibilities change on a day-by-day -day basis, and they certainly change as your loved one, uh, the dementia progresses. The demands of dementia caregiving puts you at a much higher risk for caregiver stress, burnout, and depression. And caregivers, dementia caregivers often report that they have an increase in anxiety, emotional stress, loneliness, and sleep problems. So to get an idea as to where you might be in terms of your stress, burnout, and depression levels, I put together three different checklists. So you're going to want to have maybe a pencil and paper by you. And next to each question on the checklist, you're going to want to write a number or score it and score it appropriately based on what the question is and how you feel. So the first stress, the first checklist is going to be the stressed checklist. So in the past two weeks, have you experienced trouble falling or staying asleep or sleeping too much? Not at all, several days, more than half the days or nearly every day. Go ahead and place a score next to that question. Next, in the past two weeks, have you experienced poor appetite or overeating? In the past two weeks, have you experienced wanting to hurt yourself or the person you're caring for? In the past two weeks, have you been feeling irritable, frustrated, or angry? And have you been feeling anxious, restless or out of control in the past two weeks. So go ahead and add up your scores for, add up the scores for this checklist and we'll uh, add them all together after we do all three of the checklists. Next, we're gonna talk about the burnout checklist. In the past two weeks, have you experienced unrelenting emotional and physical exhaustion? In the past two weeks, have you been having difficulty remembering, concentrating, or making decisions? In the past two weeks, have you been feeling sick more often than usual? Also, have you been feeling worthless, overwhelmed, guilty, or inadequate these past two weeks? And in the last two weeks, have you had little or no interest in activities you once enjoyed? And again, go ahead, add up your score and have a total for the burnout checklist. And next, we're going to do the depression checklist. In the past two weeks, have you experienced withdrawing from family and friends? Have you experienced feeling sad, hopeless, or helpless in the past two weeks? In the past two weeks, have you not been seeking support or asking for help? 
in the past two weeks, have you had thoughts of wishing you weren't alive? And in the past two weeks, have you been crying easily or for no reason at all? And go ahead and add the total for this checklist. Okay, next we're going to look at what does your scores tell you. So go ahead and add up the total score for all three checklists. And if you scored 15 or more, I'm really going to encourage you to look into bringing in additional help into the home to help you with the care for your loved one. And I will encourage you to go and take a look at some of the memory care communities that are around so that you can get acquainted with them because nothing is worse than having to find a place for your loved one or having to bring in care and there's a crisis situation. So, and if you're between 29 and 45, I would really highly recommend that you also speak to uh, a counselor like myself and or a, uh, a professional therapist, a psychiatrist, but someone who will be able to also help process your feelings and emotions about what you're going through. I do want to note that these checklists are for informational purposes only, and they are not intended to assess, diagnose, or treat any mental health condition. This information is not a substitute for a mental health evaluation by a professional. So hopefully this checklist, they really are meant to just have you check in with yourselves, find out where you're at in terms of stress, burnout, and depression. So next, I'm going to talk about ways to comfort yourself. Comfort is an acronym that I came up with to help caregivers survive this journey so it's not at the expense of your physical, mental, and emotional well-being. It is a fine line between taking care of yourself and taking care of a loved one living with dementia. And it's very, very difficult to carve out time for yourself. And yet it's the very thing that's super, super important to do. So I'm going to try to provide you with some different ways to try to do that and to remind yourself you are just as important as the person you're taking care of. So next, I'm going to go over what the letters mean in comfort. C stands for coping strategies. O stands for ongoing support network. The M stands for modify your expectations. F stands for feel your feelings. O stands for overcome negative self-talk. The R stands for recognize your triggers. And the T stands for take time out. So next, I'm going to go through each one of these letters and discuss some of the ways to take care of yourself and uh, in a little more detail. So the C stands for coping strategies. As a dementia caregiver, it's really important that you have a physical as well as emotional outlets to deal with the fluctuating emotions that uh, you experience at any given moment in time. Doesn't matter where you are on this journey, that your feelings, your emotions are gonna fluctuate day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute. So some examples of physical outlets are to take a deep breath or count to three. A lot of my clients will say counting to three, I need more than three. So you could count to five, you could count to eight, whatever works for you. But the key is to have some physical outlets because the stress really breaks down the body and it influences it and affects our immune system. So we wanna have a way to release that tension physically. Blow bubbles, I like to blow bubbles. I actually have a lot of bubbles and I like to physically blow the bubbles, but you could also breathe out as though you're blowing bubbles. And then go for a walk, or I do have some clients who have great sense of humor and uh, they went to Costco and picked up a few pillows, more than one, so that they have a pillow to punch, to scream, or cry into the pillow. But the key is, is to have a way to release the tension, the feelings, and the emotions that accumulate so that the body doesn't feel trapped and it also doesn't wear your body out. 
What is also equally important as the physical outlets is we want to have also emotional outlets. So you might want to adopt a mantra. Uh, I will survive this. I am a wonderful husband. I'm a wonderful daughter. I'm a wonderful wife. I'm a, I'm a wonderful caregiver. Um, I will learn how to survive this journey by learning from my mistakes. But whatever mantra you can come up with is a wonderful way to deal with, the, again, the emotional and the feelings that come up day in and day out. You may want to recite a prayer or a quote or uh, lyrics from a song. I have several clients who have favorite uh, scripture readings from scripture. Uh, some clients have uh, some songs that just resonate with them, and that is how they deal with their feelings and emotions. Some people like to meditate. I myself like to keep a journal. I especially write down my thoughts and my feelings, especially when I am struggling with something or I'm very concerned. Uh, journaling for me helps me to process my feelings, and it also provides a little clarity on what it is that I am struggling with or dealing with. You may wanna draw color paint or listen to music or soothing sounds. When my father was ill, I used to go on long drives and listen to music. Now that was long before uh, the price of gas, but music, there's so much information about music and dementia and just music in, for general health is really, really powerful. And then you may want to talk to a supportive friend or professional. I also have a handful of friends that I can call anytime and be able to talk to them about anything that's on my mind. And then you may want to distract yourself with bird watching. I have several clients who love to bird watch. They've got a bird feeder in their backyard. And one of the things they like to do is to sit in the backyard and just watch the birds. So anything that resonates with you, that's the key. We want to have a physical outlet as far as well as an emotional outlet. So we release it both physically as well as emotionally. The O in the uh, second, first O in comfort stands for ongoing support network. As your loved one's needs increase, so do the demands and the responsibilities of caregiving. And so it's super important to establish or what I call create a support network. And what you want to do is you want to take a piece of paper, put a line down the middle of the paper, and you're going to have a left-hand column and you want to title it, Help I Need. And then the right-hand column, you can call it My Support Network. In the left-hand column, you want to write down all the things you don't want to do you don't like to do or you can't do. And you can do this at any point, no matter if you're just starting this journey, if you're in the middle of the journey, you're towards the end of the journey. But the key is to write down a list of all the things you don't like to do, don't want to do, or can't do. The right-hand column is where we're gonna look for resources. You can start with family and friends. Who can you call? to fill a need. So lots of needs that I hear is companion care, uh, running errands, um, uh, uh, being able to talk to them on a dime on the phone, and just have this list of things that you need, and then the resource who's going to fill that need. And the goal is to have all those, all those tasks, all those items in the left-hand column a resource that fills that task, each and every one of those tasks. You can have more than one resource. For example, uh, if you want somebody to bring meals, you may have two or three different resources who want to bring you a meal. And what's nice about having extra resources for each task is that you get to rotate the people because what I often hear is, I don't want to burden so-and-so. I don't want to burden my friends. I don't want to burden my family. But when we have a list of resources, we can rotate them and it decreases your feeling that you're going to burn somebody else out. Also, if we're going to start with family and friends, also capitalize on the things that you know they enjoy that they're good at. For example, I don't cook and truly I don't think anybody would want me to cook for you. And I am really good at companion care. 
I love visiting uh, people living with dementia. I just love visiting with people in general. And I also love to run errands. So I would be a resource that you would want to call and put me on the list for companion care and for running errands. And then you might want to call some of your friends who are really good cooks. Let them be the ones that bring the meals. Then once you exhaust family and friends, you can think of professional services, community services, as well as faith-based services. So step one, write down what you need help with, that left-hand column. Step two, make a list of resources that are available. That will be your right-hand column. And then step three is ask for help and utilize those resources. We don't know how long this journey is going to last. And what I'm kind of doing when I'm having you do this is I'm having you actually prepare in advance a care plan. And some of my clients will refer to it as their survival guide. And it's also going to be modified as the needs change, as your needs change, as your loved one's needs change. So this is just an ongoing list and you modify it as needed. But this is a wonderful way, again, of lining up your ducks ahead of time and also getting the help that is going to be needed as the dementia progresses, as your loved one changes, and as the responsibilities and demands increase for you. I wish I could say, uh, do this alone, that this is one journey that you cannot do alone. So the sooner you're able to give yourself permission and give yourself permission to acknowledge your limitations, give yourself permission to identify and say what it is you don't want to do or can't do, we can start now building the support network and acting on that support far earlier than if we let it go and then your health is being affected physically, mentally, and emotionally. The M stands for modify your expectations. One of the things that contributes to caregiver stress, burnout, and depression the most is our expectations. And most of us have unrealistic expectations. One of the ways you're going to know your expectations are unrealistic is we say, I should do this. I should do that. Shoulds. S-H-O-U-L-D-S. Your shoulds are often unrealistic expectations, and you want to convert your shoulds into what I call a can-do attitude, and you literally want to replace the word should with what you can do, will do, and want to do, because when we make this shift, it changes those unrealistic expectations, and they become much more realistic, and it also helps you to manage your time better. It also helps you to prioritize better. So you want to shift thinking should and think in terms of what can I do, will do, and want to do. So let me give you an example. I often hear clients say, I should be more patient. So I did this with several clients. And instead, I said, okay, let's go ahead and see what we can do to convert this. This client, particular client, very, very upset that she loses her temper, that she gets angry. She realizes her loved one has dementia and doesn't have control over the things he does, but she still gets very, very upset. So we converted her should statement, and this is what we did. I can be more patient when I don't take things personally. So one thing she realized is, wow, if I don't take things personally... I'll become more patient because I won't be so reactive. I won't be so uh, quick to respond angrily. And that also bothers her. So I can be more patient when I don't take things personally. She's working on not taking what her loved one says and does personally. And lo and behold, she's starting to feel much more patient. Then I want to slow down and think before I react. And this goes hand in hand. The more she takes things personally, the more she's reactive. And so what we've done, because she's learning not to take things personally, she's becoming much more reflective rather than reactive. And then I will ask family and friends for help. That goes a long ways in terms of us building up our patients. 
So she was someone who just felt, you know, it's my job. I need to take care of him 24 seven and realized she can't do that anymore. So I said, well, let's think of two names that you'd be most comfortable asking for help. And what is their strengths? What do they enjoy doing? So lo and behold, uh, we started with two and now we've uh, extended her support and care. We have about 10 different people that she utilizes uh, for different reasons. And we're just on the verge of hopefully bringing in home care, in-home care, to care for her husband. So you can see how this will convert, you know, this is, takes you out of the should, you know, we feel bad for the things we should be doing. And we often don't achieve the things we should be doing. And making this shift can, will, and want will make you proactive. It will empower you and it will give you more sense of control, whereas shoulds fuel us feeling out of control. The F stands for feel your feelings. Allow your feelings to gauge how you are doing. So many people repress their feelings. They push them down. They push them away. And yet our feelings are a wonderful gift that we have that can help gauge how we are doing. Instead of repressing them, instead of pushing them down, let's listen to what your feelings are trying to tell you. So there's three questions you wanna ask yourself. Number one is, what are my emotions and feelings trying to tell me? Are they trying to tell you that you're exhausted, you're overwhelmed, or you're frustrated? What are your feelings and emotions trying to tell you is a wonderful way of checking in with yourself because they're trying to tell you something rather than ignore them Let's use them to your benefit. Then question number two is, what is causing you to feel this way? What is happening that's depleting your energy? What's happening that's making you exhausted or so frustrated or overwhelmed? Is it that you're not taking enough time for yourself? Is it that you're trying to take care of everyone or that you're not getting enough sleep? So this is another great opportunity to say, hmm, I feel this way because, and then question number three is, what do you need to do differently? What do you need to do differently that's going to make you feel better? Is it that you need to take a break? Is it that you need to change your expectations? And I have to tell you, changing those expectations goes a long way. Or is it that you need to ask for help? So use these three questions to help empower you. Use these three questions to help gauge how you're doing and you're in control as to how this journey is going to affect you by listening to your feelings and emotions and allow them to be of benefit to you. The second O in comfort stands for overcome negative self-talk. I know this isn't going to sound like a big deal, but you would be amazed at how our self-talk affects us physically, mentally, and emotionally. And when you look at research and studies done on self-talk, negative self-talk especially, it is one of the first things that contributes the most to feeling helpless, and it contributes immensely to depression. So the other thing you want to keep in mind is, is that you are working so hard to provide the best care for your loved one, and you really don't deserve to be so hard on yourself, critical and judgmental. So think about you have a best friend and your best friend you would do anything for, or someone you just love and adore dearly. You probably wouldn't say to them what you say to yourself these negative, this negative self-talk. You wouldn't talk negatively about them to them. You wouldn't criticize and judge them in the same way you would do that with yourself. So I want you to start thinking in terms of treating yourself like a best friend. I want you to start thinking about you don't deserve to be critical and judgmental because the more critical you are of yourself, the more judgmental of you are of yourself, isn't going to make your loved one better and it's only going to bring you down. And furthermore, you deserve to be more loving, 
kind, compassionate, and supportive with yourself. You truly, truly are doing the very best that you can. Some days are better than others. Doesn't mean you're a bad person. So really think about converting or listening to that negative self-talk and try to replace it. So I came up with five, what I call five compassionate self-talk phrases. And what I'd like for all of you to do is I'm going to read each one out loud. And I really would like for you to read each one out loud as well, because I think there's a lot of power and it just resonates more when we say it out loud. So on three, I'm going to go ahead and read the first one, one, two, and three. The first one, the decisions I make are with the best of intentions, and they truly, truly are with the best of intentions. What trips us up is, is we put all of the value and the focus on the outcome, and the outcome isn't always what we want it to be, and therefore now we do a number on ourselves because the outcome doesn't turn out to be something that we thought would be more positive. It doesn't negate that the decisions that you're making are still with the best of intentions. The value isn't in the outcome. The value is what can I learn from the outcome? And it doesn't negate that still every decision you're making is with the best of intentions. Number two, I'm not a failure. I'm learning as I go. Being a dementia caregiver truly is a learning by doing. And often mistakes are how we are going to figure out what we could do better or differently. And you're not failing, you're learning as you go along. And you want to start phrasing things differently to yourself. You know, there's no perfect roadmap. There's no perfect strategies. I have a lovely book. I think my book is super, super helpful and super beneficial. Do I have all of the answers? I don't have all of the answers, but I did my best to provide you with as much information. And you're going to try those tricks. You're going to try those tips. And you're going to learn by doing what worked, what didn't work. Because I don't know if it's going to work 100%, but I'm providing you with information to use, to practice, and be open to learning and understanding what works by learning from what doesn't work. The third, uh, the third compassionate self-talk phrase, patience is a learned skill and I'm working on it. I truly believe a lot of us didn't come right out of the womb with a ton of patience. Patience is a learned skill. Patience is something we learn by doing as well. And I will tell you this, uh, being a dementia caregiver, you'll learn that you have more patience than you ever thought you could have. And so give yourself permission to trial and error and also give yourself permission to be patient with yourself as you learn by doing. Be patient with yourself rather than critical, rather than judgmental. Really pay attention to your self-talk. And if you find yourself being very critical, very negative, I want you to think of these and you can post these self-talk phrases. You can put them on the refrigerator, put them on your visor in the car, put them on the mirror in the bathroom. But I want you to start using these phrases as a way of omitting the negative self-talk. And if you wanna revise them, you wanna modify them, whatever. But I want you to start thinking of positive self-talk to replace the negative. I want you to start thinking, speak to yourself in the same way you would speak to a best friend, speak to yourself in the same way you would speak or support someone you love dearly, and you want to apply those skills to yourself. Number four, I'm going to have negative thoughts and feelings, but that doesn't make me a bad person. And we're going to have good days. We're going to have bad days. We're going to have negative thoughts and feelings. That makes you human. We all have negative thoughts and feelings. That does not make you a bad person. And I wish the truth be told is that taking care of a loved one with dementia is taxing and challenging. You'll have negative thoughts and feelings, but that doesn't negate the love, the compassion, the care, or the support that you're providing. Negative thoughts and feelings are 
part of being normal. And then the fifth one is I'm doing the best I can. Some days are better than others. And that is a true statement. And what I love about all of these self-talk phrases, they're true statements. None of these are, are not true. They're all true statements. So if, and, and some caregivers have said to me, you know, gosh, Tammy, I'm not sure I can come up with all positive. So if you can't come up with positive, let's compromise and come up with what I call neutral statements of fact. So you just state it without being critical and judgmental. For example, today I had a hard day because, don't go any further with it. I had a hard day because my husband got angry at me doesn't make you a bad caregiver, doesn't make you a bad person, doesn't make you this awful person. It was just a hard day because. So if you can't do the positive, let's work on decreasing the negative and come up with at least neutral statements of fact. But more importantly, I want you to be as kind and loving and supportive and be that best friend to yourself that you are for others. The R stands for recognize your triggers. I can say this definitively about the dementia journey. Your buttons will get pushed. You have a relationship with your loved one pre-dementia. And there are going to be things that are going to frustrate you, that are going to make you angry, that are going to make you irritated, that are going to overwhelm you. And what you want to do is identify what those triggers are. Because the nice thing about identifying the triggers is that once you know what those triggers are, we can prepare responses in advance. So let me give you an example. I have a client who moved away when she was in college. She couldn't wait to get out of the house because she felt her mother was very, very controlling and uh, left college and hasn't had not moved back home. Fast forward uh, 40, 50 years. And now she has moved back home in with her mother to take care of her mother who has dementia. Well, guess what mother is doing? Typical dementia behavior. Where are you going? When are you coming home? When are you going to be back? And she loops in it. So my client, the daughter is like, oh my God, I feel suffocated again. I feel like my mother's trying to control me and her buttons are getting pushed from here to Tokyo. And I said, what your mother is doing now is a symptom of dementia. And we have to sort out what she did pre-dementia very different now than her behavior now that she has dementia. So we know these are her buttons and we put together three or four different phrases for her to use. So when her mother asks, where are you going? When you're coming home? When are you going to be back? What are, you gonna, what are we gonna do when you get back? we have already prepared her on how to respond, which has increased her patience immensely. And going back to what I said earlier, she doesn't take what her mother says and does as personally anymore. She sees it's not that her mother's trying to control her, it's that these are now symptoms of dementia. So one of the best ways to figure out what your triggers are is to keep what I call an observational log and clients will roll their eyes and they'll be like, oh my God, don't ask me to do more work. But really, the gist is to figure out what your triggers are. Um, you know, keep it simple. And you could use, you know, your, your cell phone. You could use a pad of paper, whatever's easiest for you. But basically, just see if you can identify what pushes your buttons. So some other things that push people's buttons is feeling manipulative, uh, tone of voice, their body language. Uh, they question you. They become argumentative. They're accusatory. They're going to blame you for things because they don't remember they're the person that had the item last. You must have stole it. You must have hid it from them. Those are symptoms of dementia, but they can cause you to react and push your buttons. So once you can figure out what your triggers are, then prepare in advance responses on how to deal with them because they cannot change, but we can. They will say and do whatever their brain is telling them. We're on the receiving end, and that's the only thing we have control over is how we deal with it being on the receiving end. And then T stands for take time out. 
I know caregivers will say to me all the time, I don't have 30 minutes. I don't have an hour. I don't have two hours. But research shows that taking a break, 10 minute break, does a lot of good for you physically, mentally, and emotionally. And people are so used to telling me what they have no time for. I can't do this. I can't do that. So instead, what I'd like for you to try to do is to start asking yourself on a daily basis, what can I do today for 10 minutes that is comforting and or nurturing? So instead of thinking in terms of what you do not have time for, start thinking, what could you do today for 10 minutes that would be nurturing or comforting? And what I love about this is, number one, it makes you a priority. It reminds you to take time out for yourself because you are as important as the person you are taking care of. And the second thing is 10 minutes does go a long way. It 10 minutes gives you a break from the demands, the challenges, and the responsibilities that you deal with day in and day out. It's just enough time to re-energize you it's just enough time to rejuvenate you. It's enough time to take a little bit of a break from whatever you're dealing with during that day. So in terms of taking a time out, 10 minute, what I'd like for all of us to do is to see what we could do in 30 seconds or so and brainstorm on all different things that we could do in 10 minutes that would be comforting and or nurturing. And I'm going to ask Sally to go ahead and field those questions. I mean, those questions, those answers, and see what we can come up with in 10 minutes. But before, Sally, you do that, there's one thing I, I do want to share. Um, so I've had clients do this, and we may start off with two or three, and they're like, oh my gosh, you know, I can't really think of anything. Well, over time, their list starts to grow and grow and grow. And some of them have turned it into a really wonderful activity. And they'll either, so they'll get uh, pieces of paper and they'll write all these different ideas on different slips of paper. And then they either have a favorite mug or a favorite bowl, or they might have a favorite cap. Um, the Giants baseball cap is a popular one. And they put all these slips of paper into the, into a, the cap or a bowl or a mug and they pull one out each day and depending on what it says if they're in the mood that's the one they're going to do if they're not in the mood then we we go ahead and we draw something else out so it's just a wonderful way of giving back to yourself reminding you that you are just as important as the person you're taking care of so let's see what we can come up with and uh, within the next 30 seconds or so all these different ideas and you may want to put them down on a little slip of paper and do this like some of my other clients have done and put them in a little bag or a hat or a cap or anything. So Sally, you want to read uh, a few that have come in? Sure. We've got some great ones. We have listening to a podcast for 10 minutes. We have snuggling with a dog. Nice. We have playing the guitar. We have texting with a friend. Um, we have reading a book. We have listening to an audio book. Uh, watering the plants. Nice. Uh, and uh, doing a puzzle, doing like Wordle or something. Okay, great. Um, I have a little seek and find book and it's super, super easy. And sometimes I do seek and find, but one of my favorites is exactly this image that we have on the PowerPoint, and that is sipping hot chocolate. So uh, again, think outside the box a little bit. What things could you squeeze in in 10 minutes that would just be a reminder to be good to yourself, to be nurturing and comforting? So in closing, there's one more thing I'd like for all of us to do together. And that is, I'm going to read a quote by Wayne Dyer. And I would love for all of us to read this quote out loud as well. So, oh, I'm sorry, it's not Wayne Dyer. It's in closing. <laughs> in closing, please don't let dementia erode your value, significance, purpose, love, care, 
compassion, support, and most importantly, your self-worth. Thank you everybody for attending today's webinar. And I'm gonna turn this back over to Sally and I do wanna give everybody time to answer questions. So before we do that, Sally has a little more housekeeping to go over and I will turn this back over to Sally. Terrific, thank you so much. Can you advance the slide, please? Yes. Um, just a few words about how Tammy might be able to help you. She does one-on-one -on -one caregiver counseling and guidance, family counseling and coaching. She provides emotional support as well as these wonderful strategies and techniques for caregivers. She can help with uh, planning uh, dementia care and um, doing on-site consultations and assessments if you live in the Bay Area of California. She also does counseling for people who have been recently diagnosed with dementia, and they find that super helpful, and then can go visit folks with dementia and perform cognitive and physical stimulation. And so we might think, well, you know, do I really need Tammy services? And some of the times when Tammy services are needed, or are when you or your, the family caregiver is struggling with the different, um, the different behaviors and cognitive changes that accompany dementia. If you're feeling burned out, stressed, depressed, um, if you're feeling that that grief and that sadness that that is, you know, all too real. Um, if the family members are in conflict, that Tammy can be super helpful in that situation. Um, if the the spouse or parent or even the person with dementia is refusing help and Tammy can help navigate some of those tricky conversations and again develop those strategies that uh, can break through that resistance. Um, she can also perform assessments uh, to see if a person has cognitive impairment and you know if a care plan needs to be developed, as I mentioned a minute ago, and then of course providing the resources and referrals that might be needed for the person with dementia or for the caregiver of the person with dementia. Great. Okay. Okay, and then we have a drawing for our free support group, and that is um, Pat Williams. So I will be in touch to talk to you about how to redeem that. And just a reminder that Tammy's book is available both on Amazon and Audible. It's a wonderful resource and it's something you should have close by at all times. And okay, now we're going to open it up for questions.